Sup, nerds, welcome back again. My name is Nate in the Wild. Great to see you here again. I am sitting here with the all new Benro Polaris. This is a very exciting new product from Benro. It is their first foray into a motorized tripod head, and it also doubles as an astro tracker. And to be honest, they seriously went all out with this thing. It has a ton of cool features beyond simple star tracking, uh, but it also presented me with a ton of problems while I was getting it set up, which of course means there's a ton for us to talk about. So let's get into it. Firstly, a disclaimer, Benro did send this to me to test out and review, and they are letting me keep it after this review. However, all thoughts here are my own, and they have no input on if this review is positive or negative. So getting started, when I saw this thing for the very first time, it was at a trade show, and the rep excitedly told me that it can take micro SD cards internally for internal storage. Seems very helpful for downloading star maps, backing up footage as you shoot, etc. Unfortunately, what the rep should have also said is that the micro SD card is completely mandatory if you want the Polaris to function in any capacity whatsoever. Yes, you heard that correctly. A micro SD card is required to update the firmware and a firmware update is of course mandatory to use the Polaris for the first time. So without a micro SD card installed, you literally cannot even turn it on and connect your phone to it. Uh, this isn't a huge deal because I personally have a dozen of those little cards lying around, but physical storage is so cheap these days that it just kind of boggles my mind that a $1,200 piece of equipment doesn't include like eight gigabytes of internal storage for the sake of firmware updates, etc. The micro SD card slot is also in a very bizarre location that's completely inaccessible unless you remove the astro tracking attachment. Once that's taken care of, it is straightforward. And once I got the micro SD card installed, I updated the firmware and then couldn't get the device to connect to my phone, even after troubleshooting for a full hour. I kept getting an error code that said verify Wi-Fi and WLAN are turned on, which are options that my app didn't even offer and my phone didn't even have in the iOS settings menu. After a long time rooting around in these menus, I contacted Polaris tech support and after some discussion with them, it turns out the solution is to turn off the cellular antenna on your phone and then once your phone's connected to the Polaris, you can turn your cell signal back on. I still have to do this every single time I connect my phone to the Polaris, which is once again very easy easy to do, but kind of leaves me scratching my head in confusion because that seems like a really bizarre step to have integrated into the workflow. I think it's worth mentioning that I took the Polaris out not just once, not even twice, but three separate times before I was able to even get it to shoot photos. Now that I've got all the kinks figured out, it's working fine, but this has greatly reduced my confidence in using the Polaris for anything beyond just casual shooting for fun. Uh, the Polaris doesn't even have a battery level indicator, so you have no idea if it's fully charged or how close to empty it is. As a quick side note for Sony shooters, you need to have your camera set to PC remote on in order for the Polaris to interface with your camera. The default will be for all images to save onto the micro SD card in the Polaris only, unless you scroll down in your camera menu and change the storage location to either PC slash camera or camera only. Since the full size SD card in my camera is of course 10 times faster and more trustworthy than the micro SD I put in the Polaris, I personally chose camera only. Now, once you get it connected, this thing is actually a powerhouse of a photography tool. It's capable of doing just about any fancy camera trick you can dream of. You can use it as a remote shooting device capable of adjusting exposure, panning, tilting, shooting images while using your phone as a remote. Uh, you can even install a SIM card so your camera can be thousands of miles away and you can still remotely control it with your phone as long as both the Polaris and your cell phone are in an area with cell signal. Amazing. The bottom of the device is threaded with quarter 20 threads so it can screw directly onto a tripod, but it's also an integrated Arca Swiss plate, which I think is a super nice touch because it means you don't ever have to worry about forgetting a base plate. Uh, it's a small touch, but it is one that I really appreciate because a base plate's one of those things that's just so easy to leave at home before you take out on a shoot. I will say that I don't love the exposure adjustment interface in the app. 
it's fine and it works, but to me it feels a little bit clunky. I think I'd probably generally prefer to adjust the exposure on the camera and then just use the Polaris to trigger the exposure, but again, it's fine, it works, it's just not a fully intuitive UI. I am already dreaming of using this to do remote wildlife work, in which case I will absolutely be adjusting exposure through the app and I'm not really that worried about it. However, you do not have control over the focus points on your camera for either photo or video. And to me, this is a massive deal breaker. I've been assured that this function is coming through a future firmware update, which is nice, but not being able to choose your focus point while remote shooting more or less renders the entire device useless for remote shooting, at least for anything professional. Benro bills Polaris as the world's first smart tripod head, which means in addition to remote shooting, it can do basically everything else you can dream of. It can shoot and stitch panoramas internally, exposure bracketing and HDR, focus stacking, it can shoot time lapses both with and without motion, and it can even stack multiple exposures and intelligently select and remove people from landscape scenes. All of this sounds truly incredible in theory, but I did have some struggles, as I mentioned, getting it all to work in practice. The first major downside to me is that you can only view your images in the app if you're shooting in JPEG. If you shoot in RAW, you can only view them by downloading each image individually to your phone and then opening them in your favorite photo app. Since both the iPhone Photos app, Sony Imaging Edge, and Lightroom Mobile are able to preview RAW images directly from the camera, I know this technology exists and is extremely doable, which begs the question, why doesn't a digital tripod head specifically designed for remote shooting come with that as an option uh, by default? As for the other functions, the panorama function feels very exciting, but is wholly unnecessary for me since I can shoot a panorama handheld with 100% success and then stitch it in Lightroom in about 30 seconds. Getting the panorama set up on the Polaris took me a bit of time and a bit of trial and error since the menu asks you to choose how many degrees of lateral motion you want between frames, and it's just not how I mentally compose my panorama process. Once I got it set up in shooting, uh, the app actually froze solid while processing the time lapse and stayed that way for a full 10 minutes. I had to force quit the app, restart the Polaris, and then the entire panorama was gone from the memory card. I repeated this process for about an hour before I decided this wasn't worth my time and I gave up. Again, a panorama takes me literally 30 seconds to shoot by hand, so a $1,000 piece of equipment that makes my workflow more cumbersome just doesn't make any sense to me. After yet another discussion with Polaris support, we found a way to disable the internal panorama stitching function, and I was able to very quickly shoot a panorama in the field and then stitch it at home in Lightroom. Uh, still not entirely sure I see the point in this feature since I've just been shooting panoramas handheld for the last five years, but, uh, and you can do it basically on any standard tripod as well, but I guess it's cool to be able to automate it if you want. Maybe it opens up opportunities for panorama time lapses. The Polaris can also shoot HDR images, which is basically another way to say exposure bracketing. This function worked well for me in practice, but since exposure bracketing has been built into every digital camera since like 1995, I'm not sure this is a feature I'm going to be using the Polaris for. Another fun feature of the Polaris is the focus stacking setting, which again worked really well for me right off the bat. For those who don't know, focus stacking is when you take multiple shots of the same composition, but with the focal point in different locations within the frame, this leads to the final image being 100% in focus, which creates a really dynamic image with infinite depth. Uh, this process is very tedious to do by hand, and while lots of high-end cameras have focus bracketing built into them, lots of high-end cameras also don't, so this feels like a pretty fun addition to the Polaris that I could see myself using in the field. Um, I guess as an example, I own three professional full-frame cameras, and only one of them has the capability to do focus stacking, so this is kind of neat. Next, I moved on to my personal favorite photography feature, you probably won't be surprised, time lapses. The Polaris can shoot time lapses either static or with motion. Static time lapses don't seem like a great uh, use for this piece of equipment, unless your camera doesn't have any sort of built-in intervalometer, I suppose. Uh, however, motion time lapses, or a, a path lapse, as the Polaris app calls it, are a very cool way to add some pizzazz to your time lapses with camera motion over the duration of your shoot. Now, I shoot my motion time lapses on the Rhino Arc 2 slider, and while it does a fantastic job for the most part, it has some major shortcomings, and I was curious to see if the Polaris suffered from the same issues. I am beyond thrilled to report that the Polaris 
far and away exceeded my expectations and actually has capabilities far beyond that of the Rhino. First, you can adjust the exposure while the time lapse is shooting, either in the app or directly on the camera. This is huge because it means that full Holy Grail time lapses with motion are possible on the Polaris. Secondly, you don't have to keep the app open for the duration of the time lapse. You can use your phone to scroll social media, take selfies, read an ebook, or do anything else you want, and the app continues to function in the background and keep your time lapse going. Even better, I tested this by force quitting the app on my phone while the time lapse was running, and the Polaris continued shooting the time lapse even with the app completely closed and my phone turned off. This is awesome because it means you can program the time lapse, and then all the settings are saved directly onto the Polaris. So there's no risk of running a six hour time lapse and ruining it halfway through just because your phone died or the Bluetooth connection blipped out. Thirdly, and this is awesome, you can set more than just two keyframes, and even better, they can have a custom number of frames between each keyframe. I tested this by shooting a very weird time lapse just to prove it was possible. Uh, it's not the best time lapse you're ever gonna see, but it's immensely cool to me that I could program the Polaris to start in one position, shoot 100 frames while moving to position two, shoot 40 more frames before position three, and then shoot 47 frames as it moved back to position four. This opens up a ton of creative possibilities that I absolutely love. And if Benro releases slider rails that the Polaris can attach to, I will sell my Rhino setup literally that same day. If that's not good enough news, the Polaris is able to run the astro tracking function and the time lapse function simultaneously. So you can do motion time lapses where the camera follows the path of the moon, the path of the sun, or the stars. I dare you to tell me that's not cool as hell. And of course, speaking of astro tracking, I'm guessing that's why most of you are watching this video in the first place, so let's get into that. Now, first things first, I should mention that I have literally never used an astro tracker before, and in fact, I just learned the phrase equatorial mount a few months ago. I am as green and new to this technology as they come, which makes me a perfect guinea pig for this. I went into this with zero idea what I was doing, and it took me at most five minutes to get the Polaris set up, oriented properly, and shooting. The Polaris has built-in GPS, so it automatically knows your latitude and longitude, and then all you have to do is place your phone alongside the mount, and it knows your north and south orientation. From there, it auto tracks to a bright celestial object like Jupiter. You manually fine tune the adjustment and then you're good to go. Of course, in true Polaris fashion, the illustration of the direction to orient your phone is actually backwards. So my first attempt failed, but I quickly realized that the app was telling me to do it backwards. I fixed it. And about 45 seconds later, I was perfectly aligned and ready to shoot. Now you're probably watching this sometime around uh, the new year, which means that we are a long way out from Milky Way season. So these shots aren't spectacular examples of night sky imagery, but they do a good job of demonstrating how good the Polaris is for sky tracking. You can see the stars are extremely crisp and sharp across the frame, despite this being a full 60 second exposure, which is basically the entire point of a sky tracker. So mission accomplished. Now, at the very end of my session, I decided to get weird with it, and I put my 400 millimeter f2.8 G Master onto the Polaris just to see if this thing would be good for deep space stuff, and I'm sad to report that it didn't quite have the stability for this. The motor seemed to be fine in terms of torque, but the smoothness wasn't quite there, and all my shots ended up with a little bit of motion blur. Benro claims a weight capacity of 15 pounds, and this camera and lens combination comes in at just under nine pounds, so there's a high likelihood that this was user error rather than a shortcoming of the product itself. This tracker doesn't have the option uh, for counterweights to compensate for he heavier lenses or telescopes, so I'm gonna keep playing around with ways to balance this lens more effectively, and I'll be sure to release an updated video if I find any sort of success with that. So those are my thoughts on the Benro Polaris, a very impressive piece of new tech, breaking barriers within the photography industry, but with some serious kinks that need to get worked out in future iterations. Will I continue to use it going forward? Absolutely, without question. I am very excited for Milky Way season next summer, and I think I'll even probably use the astro tracking this winter for some super unique Northern Lights time lapses. However, would I be thrilled if I had paid the full MSRP of nearly $1,200 for it? I don't think so. I think if I had paid for this, I probably wouldn't be very happy. So 
there you have it. Thank you all so much for watching again. I really hope you found this helpful and informative. If you enjoyed this, please consider clicking that like button so the algorithm gods can bless me from above. Maybe even click subscribe, tell your mom, and mail a letter to your congressman. Until next time, I am Nate in the Wild. Thanks for getting nerdy with me.